The best way to introduce our next speaker would be to say that he is New Zealand's leading legal expert on both the Act and its application to the industry. He probably works for the country's number one public law experts as well, and yes he does, and it's called Chen Palmer. Ladies and gentlemen, please put your hands together for James Dunn. Good morning everyone. Uh, Grant's asked me to, as, perhaps as a sort of a taster for the rest of the uh, event, to take everyone through the, the, the Act, the New Zealand solution, how it came about, uh, what it means and where it, all fits, where it fits into, into the grand scheme of things. So I thought I'd start that by talking about the principles and the purpose behind the Psychoactive Substances Act, because in many senses they are the most revolutionary part of, the, part of legislation in, in a New Zealand drug law and even a global drug law context. So the purpose of the Act, and this is set out in Section 3, is that it's to regulate the availability of psychoactive substances to protect the health of and minimise harm to individuals who use psychoactive substances. So in there we've got a recognition that the purpose of this legislation is regulation, and we've got a recognition that individuals do use psychoactive substances. And then moving on from there, you then move to the principles behind the Act. And these are the principles which every decision maker under the Act has to take into account. Uh, that a psychoactive product that is approved for use by individuals should pose no more than a low risk of harm to individuals who use it. And before a psychoactive product that is approved for use can be, sorry, can be approved for use by individuals, the degree of harm posed by the product to individuals who use it should be assessed by the authority on the basis of, and this, this is important this part, on the basis of evidence and the advice of an expert advisory committee. So we're not talking here about uh, whether the risk of harm should be assessed on the basis of what a politician thinks about it, or what the media thinks about it, or even what the people who use the product think about it. We're talking about evidence, evidence meaning preclinical and clinical trials into the safety and efficacy of the product. A psychoactive product that poses no more than a low risk of harm to individuals should be approved, and a psychoactive product that poses greater than a low risk of harm to individuals should be prohibited. And finally, a psychoactive product that has not yet been approved should be prohibited on a precautionary basis until it has been assessed and the authority is satisfied that it poses no more than a low risk of harm to individuals who use it. So what we've got here effectively is a market clearance system. If you want to enter the market, you must provide reputable clinical evidence to the Psychoactive Substances Regulatory Authority that your product poses no more than a low risk of harm. And until you, until you can do that, you are not permitted to sell it. One of the other things that's important to understand about the Act, and this underlies a lot of how the Act fits together, is that the Act draws a distinction between a psychoactive substance and a psychoactive product. A substance is your active ingredient, and a product is that active ingredient packaged up and ready for retail sale. And the reason that approach has been taken is what that means in terms of risk assessment is that you're not looking at a substance and trying to work out every conceivable way that it might be used and every conceivable concentration that it might come in and work out whether that's safe, you're looking at a product, a product where in theory you should know how much it weighs, how much it costs, how it's packaged, how it's supposed to be used, how much stuff is supposed to be in there and what the expected effects are going to be. And that's really important in terms of making decisions on an informed, evidence-based basis. The Act establishes a really detailed system of control at almost every level over the, over the market in psychoactive substances. So the starting point in the New Zealand context is that the import of psychoactive substances requires a licence. Uh, at import, the authority requires evidence that the substance you're importing is what you say it is. Uh, the manufacture of psychoactive substances requires a licence. Increasingly now, the code, there's a code of manufacturing practice that has been rolled out over the next two to three years. That will move manufacturers towards uh, total GMP compliance status probably by the end of 2015-2016. In terms of wholesale, that, is, that also requires a licence, and finally, retail licences. You know, you must, every retailer must have a licence, whether they wish to sell online or through a physical store. And off to the side of it, there's also uh, a licence for research, which is really important, because one of the concerns when the Act came through would be that it would actually represent a block on research. Because the way the Act works is to blanket cover every psychoactive substance that has ever been invented, and in fact, some that haven't. Uh, it's important that there is an opportunity there that researchers who wish to research psychoactive substances still have, a, still have a way to do that that it complies with the law. Next question. 
what exactly is a psychoactive substance? Quite important because it affects what the act applies, what the act covers to. The act defines a psychoactive substance, and this is this is. Yeah, you will have questions about this, so just be, bear with me. Um, it's a substance, mixture, preparation, article, device, or thing that is capable of inducing a psychoactive effect by any means in an individual who uses that substance. So what you're looking at there is a very broad attempt to future-proof um, the act against anything people might come up with in the future to induce psychoactive effects in people. Now, accepted from that definition, uh, we have controlled drugs, uh, precursor substances, so we're looking at the precursors to, for example, methamphetamine, uh, medicines, herbal remedies, uh, dietary supplements, food, alcohol, tobacco, and the catch-all, anything else the authority decides ought to be a psychoactive substance. And this is to avoid the kind of situation where somebody presents uh, something as, for example, fish flakes or CD cleaner or sticks not for human consumption on it, but as soon as you look at it, you know that it's for human consumption. We all know the kind of products we're, we're thinking about here. So obviously one of the big gaps in that, of course, is that it doesn't apply to, to currently controlled drugs. Those drugs remain illegal. But there's a very broad range of substances that will apply to. There is, of course, a legitimate question here about what induce a psychoactive effect means, what the primary purpose of inducing a psychoactive effect means. At the moment, and so far, we're only, only eight months in, um, it's, that issue hasn't really come up. Every, every product that's kind of come under the ambit of the Act, everyone knows was always supposed to come under the ambit of the Act. But it probably will be an issue that will come up sooner or later, particularly as the, so there's an aligned piece of regulation coming through probably this year, which will deal with uh, natural, natural supplements and herbal remedies and that sort of thing. And you might then start to see some, some potential for, sorry, some potential for, for a, bit of, a bit of back and forth about which regulatory regime a particular substance fits into. So once you've got your substance and you've come up with your product, how do you go about getting it approved for sale? You'll have to make an application to the authority, and as I've said, that application will need to be supported by evidence. Uh, that evidence will be then assessed by an expert advisory committee. Uh, that committee is made up, again, not of politicians, and not even of, of sort of representatives of the general public. It's made up of experts, of experts in toxicology, of experts in pharmacology, of experts who will assess the evidence you've put forward, which is likely to involve uh, both preclinical evidence, i.e., to be frank, proof that the substance you want to put forward is not poisonous, and uh, clinical evidence, which will be around the effect the substance has on people. How addictive is it? How much do they want to use it? Does it really deliver the effects you say it will deliver? Unlike uh, pharmaceutical medicine, it's not likely that one of the real key tests there will be around efficacy. And the reason for that, frankly, is that if you want to go out and sell a psychoactive substance that doesn't work, that's not the authority's problem. That's going to be your problem with your consumers. In terms of enforcement, the Act re rep replicates the Medicines Act in many senses, which is a public health angle. So we're looking more at fines here, which reflect the fact this is that these offences are essentially regulatory. So fines rather than imprisonment. I think there is a term of two years for deliberately selling an unapproved substance. And at the very, very bottom level, if you're found in possession of an unapproved substance, you can get an infringement notice and a $500 fine. Now, frankly, I think that is a solution in search of a problem, but at the CERT committee, when they put the legislation through, felt very strongly that they needed to, to send a strong message against something or other. Uh, once a product has been approved, it's still subject to a range of controls about how it's packaged, packaged and sold. So the key one is that it has to be sold, obviously, in a licensed premise. A licensed premise in this context uh, will, means one that's been granted a license, uh, kind of premises that are excluded from having access to a license, uh, petrol stations, dairies, uh, anywhere that sells alcohol, tents, uh, mobile vehicles, uh, and anywhere else the authority decides that perhaps it would be best not to have products sold from. Now, obviously, the key thing that we're, this reflects is concern over the previous two or three years about these products being sold from dairies. I'm not certain it was ever a huge issue that they were sold in petrol stations, but um, that's, that's, again, that's in the legislation, so it's important to bear, bear it in mind. There are also controls on who these products can be sold to. They can't be sold to anyone under the age of 18. Packaged, products have to be packaged in particular ways. They have to include health warnings. Increasingly, they'll have to include barcodes, batch numbers, uh, all of the information about ensuring that a substance is, is, is safe, that people know what they're using, they know what they're getting, they understand the risks of using it, and they know, they know the consequences of doing so. So how do we come to this legislation? 
We came to this legislation because we tried a range of other options in terms of controlling new psychoactive substances that if you would go anywhere else in the world, they're now trumpeting as new and innovative measures. So we're looking here at, for example, analogues, uh, at emergency scheduling, at, um, at trying to impose blanket bans. We've tried all of those over the last 10 years. Not one of them has worked. In most cases, they haven't even worked for a day. Uh, we had emergency scheduling of psychoactive substances between 2011 and 2013, and I don't think a day went past when psychoactive substances were not legally available in New Zealand. So one of the advantages of this Act is that it does represent, as, as Ethan said earlier, a real breakthrough, because it's a recognition by a government that if, effectively, if you must use drugs, use these ones. We know these ones are low risk. We're not saying they're safe. In fact, under the Act, it's illegal to claim that your drug is safe. But we do know they are low risk. And we'd rather that you use these than dangerous drugs where we don't have control over the market, we don't know who's selling them, we don't know who they're being sold to. So this Act, in many senses, is all about control. It's about admitting this market exists, admitting that it will continue to exist, no matter what we do, and saying, well, if it must exist, let's take control over it. Let's understand how it works. Let's establish a system where when every psychoactive substance enters the country, we can track it through every manufacturer and retailer down to a granular level. So if there is contamination, if there is a risk of harm, we can easily take that product off the market and protect the public and protect public health. The Act is, inter is interesting also because of these potential international ramifications. And some of these, I think, funnily enough, are quite optimistically included in the legislation. Uh, there's provision in the Act for export certificates where the authority provides, will provide a certificate for, your, for an approved product that says, this is an approved product, we're satisfied it poses no more than a low risk of harm. Now, in 2013, it's not quite clear what anyone else would actually do with that certificate, but it might be that in the years to come, as other countries catch up to us, that you're looking there at a system of mutual recognition where having got a substance approved or product approved in New Zealand or Australia or elsewhere, there'll be some level of, some ability to take it from country to country, much in the same way as we do with medicines. So there are real possibilities here for a realistic international reappraisal of where we sit, where we stand on drugs. As I've said, one of the gaps is that there is no space for control, for control met drugs in here. They're not covered off. And in the future, it may be that a future government will decide that is a much more rational and sensible way of approaching the issue of controlled drugs than what we do with the Misuse of Drugs Act, which could be charitably described as sticking our head in the sand and pretending that somehow if we ban these things hard enough, they'll go away. I mean, that's, that's never worked, and I'm not quite sure why, why it will work this time, but it is, it is, it is, this legislation creates a way through there that, as Ethan said, avoids the extremes of total legalisation and a free-for-all. In the same way that we recognise that in an ideal world, alcohol wouldn't be sold. We know that it's dangerous. We know it is extremely dangerous. We know it is so dangerous it would never be approved for sale under the Psychoactive Substances Act. But we also know that we cannot now get it off the market. I mean, the Americans tried that. They spent the better part of a decade trying to do it, and it didn't work. So it's better that if that market exists, we control it. In the same way, in fact, in a funny sort of way that we control, we've realised that a free-for-all of tobacco was the wrong choice. And if that market must exist, it must be controlled. So the Act, in that sense, as Ethan says, is an international breakthrough because it's a recognition by government that these markets can be controlled, that, it's, that the options are not just you know, wave, wave goodbye to public health or free-for-all. There is, there is a middle ground. There is a sensible solution, and this is that sensible solution. The last thing I wanted to cover off very briefly uh, are the current interim arrangements. These arrangements are, allowed, are designed to allow uh, a sort of orderly transition, so to speak, into the, new, into the new regulatory regime. And basically what we've done there is we've frozen the, the market as it was in August 2013, and the intention is that over time, as regulations come into force, uh, the interim licences will be replaced with full licences, uh, the interim product approvals, will be, which are currently more or less assessed for safety on the basis that uh, nothing bad has happened so far, will be, will be replaced with an assessment on the basis of here is your evidence that this product is low risk. So that transition will happen over the next year or the next year and a half. I mean, we are in early days yet. I want to emphasise that. This is, this, this is a very new act. It is eight months old. It is far too early now to say whether it, is, whether it will work, but all the evidence is good. We've seen the number of outlets and there's this figure that the Ministry of Health quotes endlessly that they've taken the number of outlets from three to 4,000 to 150. Now, 
we've got to bear in mind that three to four thousand. One of the problems was that is a guess because we did not have control over the market. We didn't know how many outlets were selling these products. Nobody did. Not even not even the industry knew because there was no way there was no way to tell. There was no central register. You know, no one could agree. So we've so that that control means yes, there are far fewer outlets, but now we know where they are. Now they're accountable. Now we know they have to comply with the law. And the outlets that we do have now that are licensed are complying with the law. Similarly, with products, there were somewhere in the region, the Ministry of Health thinks, of two to three hundred. No one really knew what was in them. No one really knew uh, what the effects were. They would, they, would diff they would change on a weekly basis. And all of this was actually driven by the regulatory regime at the time. So the government effectively encouraged people to do this. But we didn't know what was going on. We didn't have control. And now, under the Psychoactive Substances Act, every approved product, you can go on the website, you can look it up, you can see what's in it, you can see how much it you can see what it should look like. You can see how much it's how much is going to be there. So you know exactly what you're getting, and you can have confidence that when you buy it, that's what you will get. You won't get some batch from last year. You won't get some other product. You will get exactly what you want. Now, as I say, this act is new. This act has not bedded in yet, but it is a genuine breakthrough, I think, in drug policy. Uh, this, and to, to quote from, from Winston Churchill, I don't think this act is the end, and it's not even the beginning of the end, but it may well be the, be the end of the beginning. <laughs>